lectured as a professor at the Industrial Ecology Program uh, at the Norwegian University of Science and Technology in Trondheim. He is currently in Australia, uh, but he is still working, uh, employed at, that, uh, at, at the university in, uh, in Trondheim. Um, so we are recording this. Uh, so please switch off your microphones, uh, please. Um, so we are recording this uh, this webinar, at least the presentation part. So uh, it is important that everyone who is attending knows this uh, in advance. Uh, uh, Richard will present for th about 30 minutes and then after afterwards we'll have about a quarter of an hour for uh, questions and, and answers. Uh, and you can then raise your hand if you would like to ask uh, a question. Um, so as I mentioned already, uh, Richard is uh, uh, at the Industrial Ecology uh, Program uh, at, uh, at NTNU in Trondheim. He has more than uh, 100 publications, uh, which yielded them uh, uh, a nomination in the list of highly cited researchers of the uh, Clarivate, which is the company that manages the web of science. He is also editor of the uh, Journal of uh, Industrial Ecology, and he has specialized in what you could call quantitative sustainability science, uh, which is uh, very uh, roughly said uh, at the crossroads of life cycle analysis and input output uh, analysis. And Richard is one of the uh, main developers of, uh, of Axio Base, which is one of the highly used uh, global input output initiatives uh, uh, with which uh, many of us are actually working in our uh, research. Um, so uh, I think it's uh, time uh, to give the floor to Richard. Richard, thank you very much for uh, being here. We look forward to your uh, to your presentation. Great. Go ahead. Thanks, Pat. Um, let me just. I, I just muted everyone anyway, just in case. Um, I'll just share my screen. You can see that, I assume. Yeah. But maybe you can unmute and confirm. Yeah, we can. Uh, we can see it. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction, Bart. Um, yeah, and thank you very much for the invitation to do the presentation today. Um, and I'd also like to thank uh, the colleagues, the, the publications that I've been involved with uh, to a large part, thanks to um, a lot of great colleagues and PhDs and other people who have um, driven a lot of the research, um, some of which I will present today. Um, as Bart mentioned, I have been in the Industrial Ecology Program at NTNU in Norway uh, for a little over a decade. Um, but I'm originally from Australia, and just like, I guess, an Australian boomerang, it goes away and comes back. Um, for the last couple of years, I've actually been back in Australia, and um, I'm actually looking at returning uh, here full time right now. So I'm still working for NTNU for the year, but um, it's a bit of a transition phase for myself. Um, so my presentation today, um, it's basically broken into, into two halves. It's not a particularly deep presentation. It's not uh, overly technical. It uh, summarizes some of the kind of current status of what we've been doing um, related to the Xiobase data, database in the first half of the presentation. So Xiobase, as I introduced, is used in a lot of um, sustainable consumption and environmental work. Um, and in the second half of my presentation, I will um, just give a bit of an introduction introduction to some of the work that uh, we've been doing at NTNU that uh, tries to kind of pull apart um, these environmental footprints or consumption-based accounts that we calculate and understand essentially, you know, what to do about them. So, um, yeah, without further ado, um, if people have any problems um, understanding me or with pace or following the slides, I think your option is to raise your hand um, and then we'll try and sort something out. If lots of people raise their hands, I will stop and, and, um, and 
take a pause. So I'll just start off with why we're actually looking at sustainable consumption or consumption-based approaches. Um, some of this stuff is very background for a lot of you. Um, we know that consumption-based approaches essentially are what we can use the term environmental footprints as well. So things like carbon footprints is a consumption-based approach, how much carbon embodies in our, in our consumption. And the problem is that we saw, especially over the kind of growth of the of trade with the WTO expansion and the like, as we all know, was a was massive growth in outsourcing. A lot of this went to uh, countries that um, had not so clean environmental uh, profiles as some of the more developed countries. So um, there's a lot of emissions embodied in, in trade that grew um, through the 1990s and 2000s. So we use these consumption-based approaches to kind of capture the global impacts of, um, of, our in, of our consumption, of our lifestyles. And the problem that we had was that there's a lot of developing developed countries, so the, the wealthy, the OECD, European countries, that were reducing their footprints. So this is the carbon footprint in the blue line of the OECD um, countries that you see there at the same time as their actual consumption-based accounts were increasing. So they territorially, they were reducing, but their consumption-based accounts were, were increasing. So it was a kind of a problem to deal with, even if Europe manages to decarbonize completely, uh, we still need to kind of work out what to do about all the emissions in other regions of the world, part of which is due to the consumption in Europe. Maybe the second motivation for why we look at these consumption-based approaches is the is this increasing need to actually kind of ramp up demand side mitigation measures. Um, so a lot of, I guess, policy and a lot of um, scenario modeling as well is, has been focusing on technology solutions to um, the, uh, the issues we have around climate change, um, as well as other environmental problems. Um, but we consistently see when we do our historical analysis, the major kind of uh, amplifying effects that things like affluence and consumption have. So we, we still need to kind of complement what we can do on a technology side, which probably seems like it's not going to achieve the types of goals we're setting out for ourselves in uh, reducing global warming to 1.5 degrees with something that actually does something about um, the type and scale of, of consumption and demand side aspects that we um, that we face. The third thing that I think is quite relevant for why we actually look at consumption-based approaches is this question of equity. Um, so what you see on the right there is just an image from Oxfam that relates to some of the work I will also present later, is where we have, you know, the, the wealthy um, population of the world responsible for a lot of the, or the majority of the emissions. So here the top 10% responsible for 49% of global emissions. So we have this kind of equity from an environmental point of view as well, where it's not only the people who have the largest income, they often have the largest amount of agency to, to, to create change. And it's also the people who um, are kind of buying goods and services that have environmental impacts, both in their domestic economies, but also in, in other regions of the world. So it's a question about what we can do in terms of trying to um, use consumption-based approaches to actually move towards a more equitable world, both in terms of incomes and environmental effects. Um, so as probably most of you know, there's been a um, expansion of um, work in especially done by this Input Output Association. A lot of the people, I think, in the um, in the webinar today, as well as many other, have been instrumental in trying to track what's actually been going on in terms of this growth in international supply chains and growth in consumption. How things have changed, say, from uh, 1995, where cotton would be produced in one country, made into um, a clothing item in another country and potentially consume there to a more complex supply chain where we see um, a highly fragmented um, supply chains across international borders. 
Um, what was uh, developed um, over the last, I guess, 10 or 15 years, um, and this is probably background for most of you, but maybe not for all, was these multi-regional input-output models at a global scale. So where we have uh, individual countries of the world represented as different regions, we have trade between those regions, we have the environmental impacts associated with production in each region of the world, and then we have the consumption of final goods. And this is all trade linked as well. So you see in this kind of diagram is a picture of two dimensional picture of what a multi regional input output table actually looks like. Um, and the dark blocks are the domestic transactions that show if, you, if an industry purchases a certain good from another industry in a region, or the light blocks show if um, they purchase goods from other industries in different regions. Um, the mathematics of actually calculating an environmental footprint or a consumption-based account is actually very, very simple. Once you have these multi-regional IA models established, um, basically it's the multiplication between the environmental pressure intensities, so this is say the greenhouse gas emissions per unit of production, by the Leontief inverse by final, by the actual goods of final demand. So um, I'm assuming everyone knows that type of information in this webinar, but if you don't, that's the two second summary. So um, yeah, so as I mentioned over the last decades, there's been a, um, a, a expansion of um, development in the MRIO um, arena. Um, there's several MRIO databases now um, there's a couple as well that are maybe more regionally focused as well that's not on this list. But the OECD have been producing a more statistical inter-country input-output database. Um, this is also in conjunction with Eurostat, who are producing a European-based um, table, it's called Figaro. Wired by uh, Bart, Eric and colleagues in Groningen um, have done two versions of their database. Uh, Aora is, a, is another database that's uh, came out of the University of Sydney originally, um, and GTAP is a is a um, trade linked MRO. Or it's a trade link model that can be set up into an MRO database as well. It's um, been around for many years as well, and was also alluded to in uh, Maureen and Elena's uh, webinar uh, a month or so ago. And the last database in the list there is an Exire base, and that's one that I've been. Uh, involved in developing a bit, and I'll give you a little bit of a rundown on what that is. So that was developed uh, through a series of EU collaborative projects led by Arnon Tucker of Leiden University. We were lucky enough to secure uh, three projects that weren't all just focused on producing Exire base, um, but we managed to at least get a yeah, at least the work package, uh, if not more, in each of those projects to do the um, uh, updates of Xibase. We started doing a 2000 version. Um, I, I only joined that project right at the end, um, but since then I've, I've been active both in Xibase 2 and Xibase 3 uh, projects. Um, just to give you a quick rundown about actually, it's a little bit historic here, but what we aimed for in Xibase 3, because it has some implications about, you know, how you should also interpret the data and the more recent updates that we have. So our main goal was to, to get time series uh, estimates of major macro level footprint and trade type analysis. Uh, we didn't really go for a very precise representation of economic structure, to put it that way. So we wanted a reasonable estimates of how things are uh, represented and how they change over time. Uh, rather than necessarily 100% um, representation um, relative to statistical data from individual statistical agencies. We had a strong adherence to macro related to the first goal and a strong adherence to detailed trade data. And one of the main things that we went for in Xibase also was um, extensive detailed and a precise coverage of environmental extensions. And we also have a, a reasonably detailed uh, industry classification and product classification to make use of those detailed environmental extensions. 
And we also wanted to get the coverage of main countries in a reasonable resolution um, in trading partners globally. Um, so last year, we um, we actually gave a, uh, a an update to the data set. So we've had a several updates over the years. Um, and um, previously, we had data that was initially estimated in 2011. This had been updated to, to about 2015. And um, yeah, over the course of the end of last year and also start of this year, we updated it to a uh, more recent year. And we call this version uh, it's version 3.8 of Xyabase that we have. So I just spent five minutes giving you a quick rundown of what we did there. Um, it's an intermediary update um, to provide more recent estimates. It's not a full database update. Uh, I just want to make sure it is explicit that there are a lot of assumptions and extrapolations and proxy data used when we do these types of updates. Um, and includes and is reliant on now casting of, of MRIA tables. So what is now casting? Um, everyone will probably have different definitions, but more generally, it's just the estimates of, in this case, MRA tables for, for the recent years, uh, for the current years, and uh, also um, it's included some near future estimates, which are clearly already out of date given the um, situation that happened with COVID um, in the last year. Um, it uses temporally consistent data, and the now casting approaches by definition, you know, use less and less actual data and more and more assumptions, the more recent the estimates become. What's actually included in the most recent update that we released it? Well, we, we took the crystal ball out to 2022. Um, this was just in line with what the IMF released in terms of their macro uh, economic forecasts. So um, we, they do a now casting procedure and, and we use their data as a constraint. Um, I wouldn't use the now casted data for 2022, especially since COVID, but um, the data is there um, in, in the database. So things to keep in mind, um, the original reference year for all this stuff was actually still based on Xibase 2 in, in 2007. Um, an explicit consideration of available supply use tables or input output tables is still back with the original version of Xibase 3, which only includes um, 1995 to 2011 supply use tables. So we're not using, we haven't had the time or projects to actually update based on more recent SUTs since then. We use a slightly different approach, which I'll explain. Um, so the estimates of structural change post-2011 um, are based on assumptions of coefficient of change at one level. So, um, um, and we couple those estimates about how our coefficients are with, est with actual data where available on gross output derived from auxiliary data sets. So we use FAO stat, IEA data, Eurostat data, um, OECD data um, to uh, provide us estimates on what gross output is in various years. We also introduce or we, we use the trade data from Comtrade through the Batchy database, which reconciles all that trade data together. Um, and we also use the macroeconomic data, um, estimates of gross output and statistical data on um, GDP by sector and by final demand category. Uh, for each year. So we, we coupled all that data together. So I just wanted to, you know, try to summarize in one um, slide what the kind of key kind of shortcomings and the key approaches are that we actually take um, in this kind of now casting updates. As I mentioned, the SUTs are quite old and we would love to get a significant project to create a a new exile based version that would actually um, incorporate a, a, you know more updated SUTs from around the world. Um, so anyway, do that for discussion later. Um, in the extensions, we 
update the CO2 fuel combustion, so Akatsu to the area, uh, updated that data to 2015 from a bottom-up approach, and we extend that uh, with top-down data to, to marry the bottom-up and top-down data um, out to 2019. So um, uh, yeah, using more aggregate data sets. Another greenhouse gas emissions out to 2017, um, and some of the other uh, extensions we haven't updated uh, yet. Alrighty, um, I just wanted to also say we also have been working on regional desegregation work as well. So uh, Evan Biele was a, a PhD student who um, tore his head out about adding some regional resolution to Xire Base, um, and this was estimating um, uh, yeah, at a country level, um, so breaking down our rest of the world regions. Uh, that we have. Um, future developments we have around Xibase. Um, basically, what we've been doing for the last couple of years, um, and I think is likely to happen towards the future as well. Um, NTNU is still interested in keeping things going, as well as CML uh, with with Arnold, um, and I think some other people as well who have been involved. Uh, we basically is looking at ad hoc updating as we go. So we do not want to see Xiobase die, but we also don't have a major project to update it. So we do it as a, as kind of a side project as needed for other projects. Um, yeah, as I mentioned before, it'd be nice to get a full project to do the full SUT uh, to segregation again. Um, but this is, is much more involved work that's required there. Um, and in the short term, we're, also, we're basically looking at um, kind of converging the desegregation of the rest of the world data with the more recent release we did for Xiobase 3 to, um, to have a, a, a single database again that can be run in either a disaggregated regional or an aggregated regional form. So, um, yeah, that's basically my rundown. First half of the presentation of Xiobase in a nutshell. And then I wanted to spend the next 10 minutes or so um, going through some of the uh, the application work that we've used Xiobase for as well. So um, so this is the more more the applied stuff. So I don't know some of the this presentation might be interesting for some of you guys as kind of database nerds or whatever in the first half. Um, the second half is trying to get a little bit more into, okay, well, why do you make these databases and, and what do we use them for? Um, I'll just re basically go through um, at a fairly high level some of the recent work that we've, I've had through um, yeah, some of the PhDs in my research group have done a lot of interesting work. Um, I can't go through all of it, but I'll provide some references to the work at the end that you can follow up on. So um, basically, we use Xibase to understand the size, structure, and these equity aspects revolving around environmental footprints. So if you remember back to the, the introduction to the presentation, we're talking about trying to kind of both understand what's going on in terms of outsourcing, what are the options for mitigation, and what kind of, uh, kind of equity aspects we are dealing with as well with environmental footprints. Yeah, so we got this goal to inform mitigation measures and motivate, engage those with the agency to reduce their footprints, to summarise in two points. How we do this? Well, what I'll present is, um, I guess, maybe for some of you fairly simple ways of breaking down the footprints into the product level consumption categories and linking in, at, um, to socioeconomic clusters, different income groups and the likes, and uh, different drivers. So at a, at a simple level, I don't know if you guys have seen this type of figure before, but it allows us to kind of visualize what a carbon footprint of a region might be breaking broken down into our the carbon footprint multiplier that we have and the expenditures that we have for um, for uh, for that certain population. 
So this was, uh, I think, for Europea, um, but I'm, I'm sorry, I forget the actual uh, country of the analysis that we did, but it's from Diane Ivanova's paper back in 2016. And the MRIO data, um, you know, the final demand essentially gives you how much money is being spent on different types of consumption categories, on services, mobility, clothing, etc. And then the um, the environmental and economic part of the MRIO table with the trade aspects gives you the multipliers, it gives you the emissions per unit of goods consumed. So you get a pretty quick overview and none of this stuff is, is rocket science or anything new about what is the um, uh, kind of relative intensity of consuming a product where you have things like mobility, driving cars, flying, having very high intensities, um, but relatively lower levels of expenditure compared to what you have in the service sector, which has a relatively high amount of expenditure in terms of consumption, but a relatively low carbon footprint multiplier. Um, so that's, that's basic stuff that you do in, in environmental footprint analysis. And we see how that's kind of changed over time as well. And we see kind of the issues that we, we start getting into some of these things because it's some of the ones with the large multipliers, such as the mobility. So if you look at the kind of middle of the graph here, this shows the change is in environmental footprints um, for, for the EU from 1995 to 2011. So if it's greater than one, then it's increased by say 50% if it's 1.5. And you see the big increases in mobility and manufactured products that are generally happening for a lot of different environmental indicators. Clothing and footwear as well, although that's a less, you know, a more minor contribution to the overall scale. Um, now, to understand kind of what's going on there, um, the first thing that I guess um, people, I guess, like to do is make this link to incomes and how people actually change their expenditure and their environmental footprints um, as their income changes. And this, you know, has a kind of a big impact, especially for some of the developing regions where we're expecting, um, you know, massive increases in income in future years. So um, one of the works that we did based on the time series of Xiaobase data, so um, Avon Biela also did this work um, about estimating using a, a demand system model, the elasticities of different consumption categories. And, um, it essentially it is, tells you a similar kind of information to the previous work that I just presented there about the this increase in consumption on um, elastic goods and services. Again, this is pretty well known that people start traveling more um, as they become wealthier. So we get uh, higher levels of expenditure on air transport and on, uh, on vehicles as well, whereas their expenditure on fuel doesn't scale as quickly with income. So if you have an additional unit um, of income, you don't spend an additional unit on, on food. Otherwise, it would uh, be eating way too much stuff. But this can be interesting. Um, calculating these numbers, you know, for their own sake, but also to understand actually how that kind of plays out in terms of um, carbon footprints and the like. Um, in that work as well, is a little bit of thinking about how that would actually play out in the future. These differences in um, expenditure patterns as people get wealthier. So one of the uh, exercises that was done was looking at if people consumed as they do today versus if they consumed as they change their consumption as they get wealthier, um, would that have a major or a minor impact on, um, on the overall emissions if we projected that into the future? Um, assuming, of course, constant technology and the like. Um, and to be honest, the, the answer is no, it, it probably won't make much of a difference. There's a lot of conflicting aspects that that, um, that, uh, that cancel each other out in those, in those scenarios. Um, if you're interested in that, then I encourage you to, to have a look at that paper that's referenced there. It's also available in the, in the references at the end. Um, So 
the exar based work you know it does give you a lot of interesting analysis of how things are changing over time and this is how this these numbers and this derivation was was um carried out the second aspect that we've been working on um and i think other people have been also doing a lot of work on is um linking this into much more detailed data that we can get on household expenditure and i think this is a really interesting area that's going to be further developed it has been used previously but it'd be great to see even more development of the integration of some of these household expenditure surveys uh, into the MRO data. The household expenditure surveys essentially give you very detailed um, data on exactly what people are spending their money on, but it breaks it down into a lot of interesting um, socioeconomic variables as well. So you can get different things like education levels, how old people are, um, what the urban uh, status is, um, yeah, many different socioeconomic variables that can be uh, obtained. And these can be linked. Um, some input output databases, I see the Danish statistics recently, uh, they have a, a very nice integrated um, expenditure survey into their um, into their input output tables. Um, other ones can can essentially be linked with a bit of pain. <laughs> Um, to the input output databases in order to basically break down the demand we have for different regions. Um, so we, we did this for the EU recently. Uh, this is Diana Ivanova and, and uh, did, doing this work to get a really detailed snapshot. So we use the micro data from the um, European Household Budget Survey, which gives us about 500,000 or something individual survey points. Um, and allows us to kind of, in some ways, produce the same kind of results that we see over again. But I think it, it still it drives home uh, even more strongly some of the issues that we're dealing with in terms of the equity aspects around and around travel in particular and the like, and how this starts really dominating some of the um, the major carbon footprints uh, that we get. Um, again. You can break. You can look at the absolute terms, also in terms of the elasticities, how they change over time. And the interesting thing with such a detailed data set is being able to also calculate elasticities within quintile levels to see actually um, how different clusters of consumers at different income levels will also change their behaviour. Um, and we. We get some very interesting, I think, results in some of this. I won't go through it in detail today. It's too much detail for this presentation, but you can follow through on it. But essentially, you know, what you see here is a number greater than one is we, these are expenditure elasticities only. But um, so saying that if you um, so for a total expenditure, you spend 1.5 times per unit on air travel. Um, Whereas for food, you only spend 40% of that additional expenditure. Um, so the top line here shows the average across the EU, but if you break it down into quintile level, which is what is shown in the um, in the bottom slide, um, you get quite an interesting uh, kind of array of the changes in elasticities, especially if you start looking at land travel and air travel across different quintile levels. And it gives you a bit of an idea about just who can potentially change some of their behaviours there. Um, the kind of third piece of research I'll just wrap up with today because time flies is um, uh, then thinking about, OK, what can we, we do about this stuff? We do have a bunch of research that actually does some scenario analysis, which I won't, won't talk about today. But uh, we had this project called Lemurse that used Xiobase to calculate the environmental footprints of a couple of different um, uh, or a control group and people who lived what might be considered a, a green lifestyle. And it's kind of interesting because these, these people weren't doing, say, what if scenarios or what if I reduce my consumption by this or, or what what if I um, started you know, traveling less or um, uh, eating less meat. It was actually a survey of what they actually um, uh, did and how they identified. And um, so we, the interesting aspect of this was that in some ways we didn't see major differences in the total carbon footprint 
um, of these green lifestyle people and the control regions. Um, there was some dif difference, uh, especially around things like food and clothing. Transport, you know, was probably one of these rebound aspects where we saw actually a higher level of uh, footprint. You can look at a little bit more detail where that came from as well. This figure here just shows the um, the same data but broken down into a few more detailed consumption categories. And it, it shows on the right here, anything on the right means that the initiatives, the green lifestyle people would eat more fruit, fruit and vegetables. So they have a higher carbon footprint than um, say control groups. Um, and they also had higher levels of air transport footprints as well and higher levels of electricity. So it gives you a bit of a, a breakdown about, okay, well, what do kind of people with who live a green lifestyle actually do um, in, in these regions at the time, um, which I think is a good background for also thinking about well, what's realistic in terms of what can be achieved in terms of behaviour or change in the future. The final aspect of, of this work that I won't get into today, but one of the key results was that whilst the carbon footprint was you know, slightly lower, but not massively in that lower, was that they had much higher levels of um, kind of subjective and objective well-being uh, related in the green lifestyle indicators. So, what I mean by that is, objectively, quantitatively, we don't see a massive difference in carbon footprints, but we did get a better um, outcome in terms of uh, the well-being type indicators for these people with initiatives. So it does show that people can actually have Kind of a better lifestyle uh, whilst reducing their environmental uh, impacts in this area. So there's still potential to scale that up. And of course, things like electricity and the like, um, some of this is behavioural change, but a lot of it will also be addressed by technology um, in the future. So um, that was my 10 minute quick rundown on, uh, on, the, on the research. I had a few dot points as well that I just was thinking about before about what would be nice to see in the year or two coming. Um, I think the better integration of these household expenditure surveys into MRIO data would be a fantastic uh, opportunity for the MRIO development um, in the future. If we could actually get, the problem is we don't have time series of expenditure survey data in most countries of the world, but um, to have something like that integrated at a statistical level, um, like as I mentioned, Denmark already have, would be a um, would be a fantastic advance, I think, and allow a lot more insightful questions to be asked. Um, I think what we also need to do is so the work I presented. If you notice, I didn't really use products as we often represent them in input output tables. I use these consumption categories, which try to interpret products in terms of whether they're used for mobility or for shelter. Uh, or for food or nutrition. So a better representation of um, the services actually provided by products uh, would be, I think, very useful for you know, advancing the types of sustainable consumption research that we need to do. Um, one aspect of this as well is it's not just the consumption of goods, it's also the uses of stocks. Um, I didn't mention it today, but yeah, I, think, you know, I think I saw Carl appeal earlier uh, he did his PhD on the endogenization of capital so that we can actually include, um, you know, the, the stock aspect in terms of the delivery of services uh, when we do our environmental footprint research. And there's other work that's also ongoing uh, in that area. Third point was this last aspect I mentioned about the developing more links into more outcome-based indicators, more outcome research beyond GDP work that looks at well-being and not just thinking about environmental footprints as the tons of CO2, but interpret those tons of CO2 into what we're actually trying to achieve um, in terms of development. There's a lot of work that's going on that I know of on scenarios of demand side changes. Um, I think this stuff is going to be crucial. I think there's a huge opportunity for a lot of work to happen here. There's a lot that needs to be done for developing regions because this is going to be um, critical in terms of how they uh, uh, develop over the future years. So um, uh, yeah, it'd be fantastic to see initiatives that try to bring some of this work together, I think. 
And the last aspect, which is maybe a little bit of a nuance, is um, I think the MRA work could also, you know, the, the pricing aspects, both in temporal prices and also the prices of goods and services um, in physical terms, is something that I think is an area that still needs a lot of focus in our further research. So thank you very much. Um, that was the, uh, I think, a little bit more time than I was probably allowed, but the quick rundown of some of the, the work I've been involved with um, over the last few years to give you a snapshot. Um, I'm happy to take questions. I know it's a fairly superficial presentation in some sense, so you will have to kind of look at the references there. Um, there is an additional slide that lists all the references. Um, this presentation um, will be made available to everyone so that you can go back through it um, later and follow up any of those references as you please. So, thanks, Bart. I'm oh, sorry for running it over, but... Okay, okay. Thank you very much, you uh, Richard. Uh, Richard. Uh, no, uh, no, no problem at all uh, talking for a little bit longer. Uh, uh, it was a very rich presentation. We will stop recording uh, now. Uh, thank you uh, very much uh, for, for this. Uh, the presentation will be posted on the website of the IIOA. So if you go to IIOA.org uh, at a later stage, you can uh, re-watch uh, the uh, presentation.